All right. Hello, guys, and welcome to this episode of the Coffee Break. It's so nice that you tuned in. Um, hello, hello, everyone. I'm Sandro from the Alfred Wegener Institute. And uh, welcome to this episode of the Coffee Break. Um, it's so nice to have you here. So nice that you're joining for this episode. And we're just waiting here for Stefan, my colleague, for this episode of the Coffee Break. To So yeah, there we go. I can see Stefan. Hey Sandro, nice to see you. Hey, same here. Nice to see you. How are you? Fine. Uh, I'm happy to be back in the internet world. Uh, sometimes it's quite quite handy. Okay, that's cool. And we're not only back, we're also back with coffee. <laughs> at least I'm back with coffee, so I don't know what you're drinking at the moment. Yeah. I decided for coffee as well, and um, you know my famous mosaic mug that we uh, branded just on leg two, and um, it was with me for leg two and for leg five um, to the North Pole. So yeah, yeah, I've got a mug from Mosaic Expedition and it's proper coffee in it. That, that's pretty cool. So my mug is just a, a regular tourist souvenir mug bought in Tromso, but it was with me actually on the expedition of different icebreakers, so it has quite some story to it. <laughs> so yeah, that's quite nice, but um, yeah, so again, welcome everyone who is watching us here on this episode of, uh, of Coffee Break. Um, um, so just for those of you who are not so familiar with this format, so we are going to chat now for like 20, 30 minutes maybe, and uh, also answer some questions that you guys uh, send us via Instagram. And then in the last five minutes of this show, um, uh, we will also answer some uh, live questions that uh, come here uh, in the chat. So, but maybe we should uh, uh, start to inter uh, introduce ourselves. Uh, Stefan, who are you? Yeah, I'm uh, Stefan Graupner from uh, Jena. Um, by education, I'm a geophysicist. I um, did an apprenticeship in uh, precision mechanics before. And now I'm working most of the year as a polar guide, mountain guide, um, expedition leader, um, giving talks and a photographer. And uh, I was lucky enough to join a mosaic team for two legs, one in winter and one in summer. It was leg five and leg two. And I was a part of the logistics and safety team. Yeah. It's pretty cool. So that, that's very nice. You also did uh, two of the legs of Mosaic, uh, yeah. just with me. So I'm, I'm Sandro. I'm from the Alfred Wegener Institute in Potsdam. I'm an atmospheric scientist, a climate uh, scientist. And um, yeah, in, on Mosaic, I was uh, in the atmosphere team. And uh, what I was basically studying was uh, the, the uh, um, structure and the um, parameters of the atmospheric column above the Mosaic flow. And we did that by launching uh, uh, four times per day a weather balloon from board the ship, which uh, rises up to up into the stratosphere, thereby measuring some key meteorological parameters. And we also did uh, uh, operate a tethered balloon on the ice with uh, some similar purposes, measuring temperature and humidity uh, in, in the lowest layers of the atmosphere, actually, from the ice. So we're both active on the ship and on the ice, me and my colleague, and on the ship. Yeah. As Andrew, we, we share this experience of um, two legs of mosaic. And I would like to ask what you learned uh, from just a practical view of survival on the Russian icebreakers bringing us forth and back, or um, on Polarstern from your second leg that you could um, then uh, improve uh, for leg five. Because, for instance, for me, as we started with the coffee, I learned from our dear colleague, uh, Julia, don't know if she's here, but Julia Castellani of Avi, she was with us on leg two. She's Italian, as uh, very soundable by the name. And she took her own espresso uh, machine with her. So we, on leg two, we had uh, these nice um, coffee sessions with Julia. And that was something uh, I really wanted to have for leg five. So I 
brought uh, this machine. And I remember when we first met on Trioshnikov, um, you had some coffee and I had a machine. Yes. Yeah, that, that's actually true. So um, that's also the reason why I got this, uh, this cup uh, in Tromsø before leg one, before we started, because some people said that, yeah, you, you never know the coffee situation on these Russian icebreakers are sometimes a bit di different. And in, in fact, what we had was only instant coffee, also now on Trozhnikov, on, uh, on leg uh, five. And uh, so I, I also brought my own coffee with me, so I, I could, could have a fancy coffee from time to time. And it turned out to be uh, maybe quite a good decision in the end. Yeah, that's the practical aspects you learn. Yeah, yeah, indeed. But otherwise, did you did you like the coffee on Polarstern as well from the machine? I was really surprised how good the coffee was on Polarstern, um, the food in general, but uh, also the coffee. And yeah, probably I spent too much time of my life on Russian icebreakers um, to be uh, very humble and easily um, to be surprised in a positive way by such good coffee. Yeah, but still, I I made a habit of um, using my own uh, coffee. Um, just because just, you know, yourself, you have so man many things to do on the ship and these are the few times of the day where you can um, relax and focus and um, spend a little time of yourself. So you appreciated that. Uh, very nice. But actually, I have to say that we, we didn't meet on Troshnikov for the first time. We, we actually have a little story. Uh, actually, we met in the quarantine hotel. So before the whole cruise started, um, we had to do a corona test, of course. And then we, we actually met in the hotel. And Stefan, I think, was one of the first uh, humans from Mosaic, which I actually saw from this leg, because um, the, the hotel personnel would bring the meals, the, the lunch, in that case, towards our doorstep. They would knock on the door, and then they would leave again. And we would open the door to pick up the food and uh, actually, for one of these days during lunchtime, I think I opened the door and picked up my meal, and you did exactly the same at that point, and we discovered that we were like neighbors over the floor. <laughs> yeah, now, now that you remind me, I, I remember I uh, completely skipped this whole uh, quarantine episode out of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was quite funny. <laughs> yeah, but in the end, um, I really appreciate it. I think it was very, very good that the lack could happen in, in the way it did, that we could go there with the Trioshnikov and that we could actually make this uh, final lack of mosaic happen. I think that was really nice also from terms of, of the science that we could do. I always um, get asked when people hear that I have been taking part in two different legs, one in winter and one in summer, how do they compare and um, What's the difference and which leg I liked more? And, and it's the same for you. You did leg one and leg five. So how would it compare for you? Uh, yeah, you mean which one I like more or? Just in general, um, maybe not um, liking more or less, but what was the difference for you? Yeah, I mean, the difference was very obvious. The difference was that uh, leg one was uh, uh, significant parts of the polar night when and there, it was complete darkness in the end, and uh, of course the temperatures were much, much colder. We had temperatures uh, below minus 30 degrees back then, and now I think the, uh, the lowest temperature we had, we experienced, was around minus 14. Yeah. But that was just on one or two days, so it, it, in that respect it was quite bearable right now. But from my perspective, I think this, this, uh, yeah, this, this Arctic winter, this polar winter with all the its extremes with the darkness with the low temperatures it's also very uh, uh very very interesting to experience that it was really amazing so i i like that as well and and also now this leg of course and what for you yeah it's probably the same and but i also have to note that uh, when coming back from this long leg two in winter uh, it took me much longer to really uh, arrive at home and uh, when I was home I got sick, got a flu and uh, the whole process was just prolonged and um, probably the, um, the physical strain on the body and mind for this dark leg was um, much larger so it took me more time in spring to recover than right now. Is this same for you? Yeah, yeah actually um, with the exception of getting sick that's the same for me. I think I got sick on the way back already on Tanitzin. <laughs> So I, I had this behind me already, but this also refers a little bit to the one question uh, that we got is 
um, how, how was it like to to uh, to be living in such a place where you cannot uh, walk like freely or walk to a shop or go easily on a hike without telling anybody? Um, because that was exactly what I experienced when I came back, at least from, from the first leg and also now a little bit. Um, so you arrive at home and then, okay, I, you, you say to yourself, I could go for a walk now. Wh whom do I need to contact? Uh, do I need to call the bridge and tell them that I'm going to leave the ship? Do I need a rifle? Oh, no, I don't need a rifle now. <laughs> it's very, yeah. very strange indeed. Yeah, and there's no gangway that goes down and nobody, uh, not all the people at nine o'clock are meeting in front of the gangway. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's also nice. And you see, I have this uh, coffee break outside and I try to spend as much time as uh, possible. In, in oh, yeah, now I see you. You're sitting outside. <laughs> yeah, just need fresh air and light. But it's not as cold as on the floor yet, is it? No, actually, uh, after like two, uh, everything feels really, really warm and uh, nice. Is one question in my mind that I always wanted to ask you, but I uh, always forgot. And you've been talking about your work um, as an atmospheric scientist and that you have this tethered balloon that pulls uh, all your sensors up to the sky. And this uh, balloon is looking orange and um, we always refer to it as Miss Piggy. But who actually was uh, the first one who called her Miss Piggy? So who is to be credited if we speak about Miss Piggy? It was a really <laughs> wonderful term for this wonderful instrument. I, I know what you're getting at with that. <laughs> it, it, it probably was, was Egon, our uh, yeah, legendary site technician from Avi Potsdam here. And I mean, I think it was quite obvious. The balloon is, is it's big, it's, it's orange, it's uh, very, uh, very much filled. <laughs> so... Um, it, it has to be Miss Piggy, actually, and also it's a very nice name. So, okay, so the credit goes to Egon. That's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted yeah. to make sure if I speak about her um, to use the proper credits. And speaking about Miss Piggy, I really um, connect many um, instances um, on Mosaic Lake 2 and Lake 5 with Miss Piggy. And one was, for instance, when I was on Lake 5 on the bridge, I had a bridge watch and um, there was strong wind and Miss Piggy wasn't that high up in the air. And there was a fight between uh, one of our bamboo pools, pools and Miss Piggy. And uh, the bamboo pole was the winner. Uh, that put a tra tragic end to Miss Piggy, but thanks, uh, thankfully you had one more. Uh, so how many piggies you used over the year of Mosaic? Um, so I, I think we had one only in operation at a time, and in case uh, one of the balloons would uh, uh, would uh, get damaged, then we have uh, I think a couple of them, I think three or four in spare. So, but in the end, um, I think only two were damaged, and uh, that was that was pretty nice. And yeah, of course, the the flow in the end, as I remember, was very crowded. Uh, there were a lot of a uh, lot of stations nearby to each other, and all the people, you know, they marked their uh, their measurement site with bamboo sticks and stuff like that. And of course, for a big balloon which is uh, sitting and parking there, <laughs> it's uh, kind of a dangerous environment uh, to put it like that. <laughs> and I got uh, really one more question regarding. Um... Really not Miss Piggy, but the radio sounds. And the question was, um, what maximum altitude did you manage to reach with your radio sounds that you were um, mm. getting up every day? And um, if that uh, actually was higher than Egon's record or not? <laughs> I think Egon has a strong fan base here, I see. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think the record was something a bit more than uh, 36 kilometers. So that's already way in the stratosphere. I uh, think uh, our record now on the last leg was uh, uh, 36 kilometers and uh, 574 meters. And uh, I think Egon at one time had a, had a balloon which exceeded 37 kilometers, but he might have underinflated it a little bit. So we, we have to discuss whether this actually counts. <laughs> uh, I would suggest we discuss this with another coffee and put maybe some whiskey in the coffee or so. <laughs> maybe yeah, next time. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, it's true. But um, yeah, I think in yeah, in in the end, it was it was really really very very good effort with all these balloons. Um, we we had we had so many of them. I don't even know the the exact number in the end. But uh, it was uh, a, a lot of those weather balloons. And when you remember, we launched them in all the weather conditions from oh, the yeah. 
of Polarstern. And I remember that particularly you, Stefan, you were always there when it was very windy with your big camera and you wanted to take some nice movies or photos from uh, the people failing to launch the balloon, perhaps. So I think we have some really nice launches there. <laughs> Yeah, that was one of the little side projects, filming projects on Mosaic that I only discovered during Lake 2 when people were telling me how difficult it is to launch the balloon in um, 30 or 40 knots of wind. And uh, we have some really impressive uh, footage from the balloon that uh, is pulling Anya, if Anya is there, hi to Anya, that's pulling Anya uh, straight over um, the heli deck. And, uh, and you did a pretty good job because you have your own weight. Uh, and so did Juarez and uh, others that were not pulled away so easily with the wind. Um, yeah. And what I also liked about Leg 5 is we had so many um, vehicles in the air from the uh, weather balloons, the tether balloons, the ozone zones, uh, the helicopters, the drones, different drones. And somehow we were really well organized and managed um, on a good um, working ground with the pilots to to separate this airspace so that everybody could could use the airspace for uh, what he needed for yeah that's actually true and and it was also true i think for the previous legs when you uh, think of leg four for instance they had even one very big tethered balloon more on the ice and i think there the communication worked very well uh, also and i think communication is always the key that's also one of the things that impressed me very much about this expedition is that so many people come together with so many backgrounds and uh, scientists, non-scientists, and also scientists from different fields with different objectives and uh, nationalities. But in the end, they all work together to achieve this, this one goal, is, is to make uh, the science and, and the whole end of mosaic happening. And, and I think that impressed me very much on, on the lack that this worked very well. I don't know how you, how you see that. Yeah. And... Um... It's also um, coming to a mosaic, coming to this ship with all our different backgrounds. That's uh, referring or taking on also one of the questions we got, uh, and that is, um, how do you become a polar explorer? What, what be, would be your answer, Sandro? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I, I think in nowadays um, it is. Of course, there's a lot of uh, research going on in, in the polar regions, for instance, and. Um, to contribute to that, uh, you, you, you could become or you have to become scientists probably. And uh, therefore, I mean, my background is so I, I studied physics of the Earth system and climate physics in, in Kiel, the bachelor's and the master's program. And uh, afterwards applied for the PhD position here. Oh, you have some nice birds there. <laughs> yeah. Not so many birds in the Arctic, but here, good. <laughs> Wildlife uh, at its best. Yeah, so, and, and then I, I carried on my PhD here in, in Potsdam at AVI, and uh, I was lucky enough um, that I submitted my thesis just before Mosaic started, so I was uh, ready ready to continue with the postdoc contract and uh, contribute to uh, Mosaic with the research, which I also uh, did in, in, in my PhD, which is, which is also related to those weather balloons and these measurements. So, so that was... Uh, very, very, very lucky for me. But also you, um, I mean, you're also have the scientific background, but on Mosaic, you were in, in the logistics team. And uh, how, how did you get to this job? <laughs> and when I first got this question, how do you become a polar explorer? I was thinking back to the good old days, like, and the first person that sprang to my mind was this um, French polar explorer, Jean-Baptiste Charcot who I connect with the story when he was a small boy, aged eight or nine years old, and he wanted to become a polar explorer. He was sitting for hours in his bathtub full of uh, ice cold water um, to strengthen his body and, and mind for the polar regions, um, much to the distress of his uh, mother. So <laughs> these are the old, good old days. And then you think about Nansen and Amundsen who uh, lived with the Inuit people and uh, studied how they um, dress, how they uh, make their transportation systems with the dog sledges, um, the kayaks, uh, etc., and learned from them how how to survive in the Arctic and became polar explorers from then. And thinking second about this question, 
I think this is much from um, the polar bear behavior. We can learn what it takes to be a polar explorer, and that's um, curiosity and um, being cautious. So if you see the, the polar bear, it goes around the Arctic. It needs to be uh, curious to uh, investigate every new thing, uh, if it has any value for him as a source of energy. And needs to be cautious to weigh the risks involved with that. Uh, and that's uh, what we need to do. Um, and yeah, being curious is a good prerequisite. Um, so you can go out, uh, learn, read all the books. Um, learn from indigenous people. I had the same background, lived uh, quite a time in the uh, Chukchi um, area in the Russian Northeast. And uh, combined that with my scientific background as a geophysicist. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, curiosity is always uh, the key to uh, to finish such a, such, such a project or to make progress in, in any field of, anyways. So if you're curious about something, then of course, it, it will guide you towards your target. That's that's probably true. Yeah. So um, as I said, we also have, uh, we're taking on some live questions here as the time is approaching. And also some of the questions that uh, you guys out there already submitted earlier on Instagram, we will probably not be able to answer all of them, but uh, <laughs> I guess we will try at least. And I just saw one, one question emerging here. When, when is this uh, documentary uh, being broadcasted in the TV? And uh, that's going to be on Monday, the 16th of November, on quarter past eight on ARD television. So that is uh, um, um, a TV documentary from the UPA team. And uh, that it focuses on the first three legs of Mosaic. And uh, I think it's a really, really nice documentary. And for those of you who are interested in Mosaic, yeah, that's uh, certainly uh, a must watch. <laughs> and maybe you also see Stefan and me appear in there, although that would be in a winter leg then, and uh, we probably have some heavy clothing, so you might have some problems uh, seeing us, actually. <laughs> I might be one of the few guys not dressed in red and with a big uh, pole um, to probe the ice. Yeah, are there any more questions? Yeah, but, I mean, there were also some some questions before here. So Christmas, like how, how much time do you spend on the ship versus on the ice? So I, I think that is very, very difficult, different for, um, for what you do. So there are some scientists who are operating some instruments on the ship. And of course, they, uh, they have no reason to be uh, very frequently on the ice themselves. They just make sure they're uh, running their instruments. But uh, I, for instance, um, I also have my businesses on the ship, but we, as I said, we're also doing uh, balloon-borne measurements and also some uh, minor other measurements on the ice. And if, if you really, um, um, at the maximum, I think you could spend like six hours per day on the ice because that is the official times when you can when you can spend on uh, that you can spend on the ice if there is no special operation period with uh, longer working hours on the ice. But I mean, six hours on the ice is already uh, quite something. And uh, working over such a long time is, uh, you will, in the evening, you will certainly uh, know <laughs> what you have done. Yeah, yeah sure. For, especially getting dressed and undressed for each of the three time slots, uh, especially in winter time, just the dressing and moving around the ship fully dressed with all the equipment was a um, little sport exercise again and doing this three times a day. Yeah. And by the way, Stefan, did, did you have uh, very often the opportunity to join the coffee break on the ship? Because every day at half past three, uh, there is uh, coffee and cake offered on the ship. Yeah, not always, but quite often. And um, you remember this stern hut where we were sitting to have stern watch and to cover the back area of the ship um, and to observe it if there are polar bears. When we were in Stern Hut, we couldn't um, join the coffee break, but very, very often some nice soul from the ship, from any of the other teams came around, uh, visited us, brought us a coffee and a little cake so, and had a chat with us while we were uh, sitting there looking out. Mm. That was, was really nice and something that uh, stays with me. Yeah, that's uh, some nice treats indeed. I also experienced that 
either the polar bear guards or, or some of the other scientists would bring you something <laughs> when they come from the ship. So yeah, that's just good for the moral, I guess. <laughs> So yeah, um, what else do we have? Uh, there was a question of uh, uh, what is the thing that impressed you the most on the journey? Oh, oh that's so many things. Um, yeah, it's the, the polar night. Uh, it's meeting um, a polar bear late January that um, crossed our uh, CEO in the middle of the night at uh, latitude of um, 87 and a half degrees north. So, because we had this long and ongoing debate if polar bears are around in um, such high latitudes, and especially in winter when everything is frozen, and this bear was some 800 kilometers away from the ice edge. And yet he was um, very well fed and really relaxed and just passed um, the CEO and then went his way. And we had the same in summertime on 89 north uh, in the mid September. If you remember, basically every day we had polar bear visits on, on these high latitudes when, when the ice edge was down to 85. And we had in the leads and cracks, we had um, seals, so there was um, prey for the polar bears as well. So that was um, certainly something that uh, impressed me. Yeah. Yeah, I also remember uh, when we were approaching the North Pole uh, in, in August on our way to the flow, actually, um, there, was, there was a seal like like a hundred meters away from the North Pole. It was uh, swimming in one of these uh, melted through parts of the, of the ice. And I mean, th th there seems to be a, a plenty of life actually close to the North Pole. It's not what one maybe would expect, but apparently it's there. That was also something very, very interesting for me. Yeah, we had this uh, crazy wildlife. Remember this one duck that visited us on uh, 88 degrees north that was uh, totally off um, track with yeah. so. <laughs> and I, I, heaps of ivory guards yeah I, I haven't seen it myself actually I, I just saw the, the photo that someone had taken from it and I, I believed it was a joke someone put a, a, a joke photo in the picture folder but uh, no no I, I took the picture and um, and the officers uh, on the bridge they saw it as well um, but you guys were working so hard <laughs> <laughs> we don't see anything else, you mean. <laughs> <laughs> you just see Miss Piggy and no other animals. I got a really nice question about polar bears. Um, do polar bears get old? And probably the question behind is, uh, what is the uh, life expectancy of a polar bear? And just a look in, in wild, they usually get some 20 to 30 years old. And um, that's not <clears throat> their their ecological lifespan and indifferent to us while we are dying and we are old for cancer or for dementia or for whatever usually the polar bear's life is ended when his teeth are worn out and break and then they're just no longer able to hunt and then they starve to to death and that's also the time of their life when they are more when we have most conflicts with them because they then behave very radically Mm -hmm. In captivity, the polar bears get much older, but um, the question is if we can call this lifespan or if we should call it um, uh, imprisonment span if they are held in a zoo. Yeah. Yeah, some fascinating creatures indeed. And uh, yeah, I was actually lucky that we, we saw some of some polar bears on, on the last leg now. I think the, the leg um, before us, they had almost daily visits from polar bears, which must be, I mean, quite, quite cool on, on one hand side, but also quite disruptive also for the work on the ice, because uh, if they get too, too, uh, too, too close or too curious, then uh, people, of course, get uh, called back on the ship. But we had quite some extended um, um, amounts of time in the middle of the lag when we didn't get a polar bear visit. It was just, I think, towards the end when when this uh, got more frequent. Yeah. And I think even on the day when we left, we got a visit. Actually, we the captain said we should leave the flow uh, at uh, 6 p.m. on September 20th. And exactly at 6 p.m., this one polar bear showed up to apparently to wave us goodbye or something. And it, uh, everyone went out with the cameras. And the so the polar bear actually delayed the departure of Polarshan by 12 minutes or so. So it also made it to the history of mosaic somehow. 
Yeah, that was a bear, a bear that was hanging around all the time and uh, he nearly um, terminated our uh, last picture on the ice just two hours before. Mm. Um, and we had to concentrate the people very close to the gangway. Mm. Yeah, it was good to see so many polar bears at least in, in the summer leg. And what impressed me as well, um, continue with this question, was that all of the polar bears we saw, about 60 individuals in 45 encounters, all of them were in very good um, state of health. Uh, we visually measure the state of health of polar bear by its fatness. And we have this fatness index from one to five, one being skinny. And in opposite to us humans, um, a skinny polar bear is not healthy, but he's rather doomed because he won't um, survive um, any time without prey. And the bear, the bear, the fatness index five is the one when, when he walks that the belly already touches the ground. And all the bears we have uh, seen during this whole year of mosaic were in state three to four and a half or five. So really roundish bears that can sustain weeks or also a few months of, um, of starvation. So that was really good to see. Yeah, that was, was really good. The fatness index. So maybe maybe something we, we should also apply for the members of the expedition after three months of Polarstern Kitchen. <laughs> Did, did your fatness increase, uh, fatness index increase over the last leg or did it decrease? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. I, I didn't uh, put myself on the scale. I didn't go to the Weight Watchers Club. <laughs> Maybe for good reason. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> the, the food was, was really good, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And also another question regarding the, the ship and so is uh, what what do we do in our free time so i don't know about you Stefan, but uh, i can just speak for myself uh, already on leg one i was told taught by some uh, finnish guys of the expedition how to properly use the sauna so <laughs> i went to the sauna in the free time which we had quite often there's also a nice gym and a nice pool right next to the sauna so these are places where you can actually uh uh yeah do some uh, power outs or something if you have too much energy or just use the sauna just if you want to relax after a half day of work. So in that respect, it is, didn't feel like the end of the world really, but it was really comfortable actually on the ship. Yeah, especially if you compare it with uh, Nansen 125 years before us and how basic they lived. So it's a different um, time. And for, for leisure time, I really enjoyed on Lake 2 when our cruise leader Christian Haas founded the North Pole Skiing Society with us and once or twice a week we um, after work at eight o'clock after dinner we met um, outside we went skiing for two hours and just went deep into the dark uh, away from Polar and that was the only source of light and then uh, but also a constant source of, um, of um, emissions and then we could really listen to the quietness of the Arctic um, and, and be in total darkness and move uh, in the speed of um, the Arctic, what, what it means for me. And yeah, for Lake 2, we also had this uh, football uh, league, the North Pole Soccer League going on with four teams that were competing really hard. So yeah, it was a good, good sports uh, clubs as well. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, I remember the football games. <laughs> that was... That was quite something. And also the, the ship's crew uh, participated in that. So it was, was, was really nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Do we have any more questions popping up here or do you have anything more to say, Stefan? No, I think we're also running out of time. So last chance for questions. <laughs> yeah. M maybe all the questions were answered in the, in the previous uh, coffee breaks. <laughs> so and uh, whoever um, is still with a question you can save them for next four weeks because we will have another coffee brief and I think that's on uh, Thursday the 3rd of December at 4 p.m. so in four weeks time we don't know who's uh, going to answer the questions but it will be um, interesting for sure and um, I will join in for meeting our colleagues and Sandro you too I guess maybe, <laughs> who knows about the future. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's also a good news, I think, um, is that although the expedition is over and Polarstern returned on the 
uh, 12th of October that the coffee breaks are still continuing with some more stories from the people that uh, actually were on the ship. So it's quite a nice format. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. So thank you, Steffen. Thank you so much thank for you. this nice coffee break. And thank you guys out there for tuning in. It was, was really a pleasure to be with you. <laughs> and maybe see you next time. Okay. See you. Bye-bye.